Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this week's um, Gecko Hepatology and uh, Endoscopy session. Um, this is this is a weekly um, Wednesday session hosted by the Gastro Foundation and Project Echo, and also by the Indian um, arm of Echo, which uh, provides us with the technical support for these meetings. We have approximately 70 registrations from this meeting from, and these include those from Kenya, from Tanzania, Zimbabwe, uh, Mauritius, um, and a few others that uh, I'm sure will log in as time comes and including our own uh, individuals who are interested in this format from South Africa. Um, I would, very much like you to make this uh, interactive session. And so from that point of view, we would like you to use the chat box to post your questions. Um, we will, um, we are going to slightly run this session slightly differently to uh, as is billed in the, in the advert. Um, this is a very rare opportunity that we have um, managed to get Michael to come and speak to us. Uh, Michael's from Kenya, and um, he's a general surgeon, and uh, I think to say that he multitasks is uh, quite uh, an understatement of his achievements. He, he works at the Christian Hospital in Tenwick. I'm sure he's going to tell you a little bit more about that, which is uh, in a region called Bomat. And he has played a leading role in the African Academy of Christian Surgeons, the Colleges of East and Central and Southern Africa, COSEXA, uh, well known in the surgical community for trying to promote standards in surgical training. And he's Secretary General of the Surgical Society of Kenya and was one of the founding members of the African Esophageal Cancer Consortium, which he was the chair of uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, that's how I came into contact to him through my WGO contacts. Uh, in Ethiopia and the Mayo Clinic, uh, Mark Topazian, who's done a lot of research with, uh, with Michael. What we're going to do is, he's going to really um, be the main, the main talker. We're going to pause his talk at certain aspects of it, um, as, it's, as it's really in three parts. And we will run some very short polls, uh, about three polls during the middle of this, and at the pause breaks, um, we will take questions um, from the audience, or I will pose what questions are in the chat room to, to Michael and to any other individuals uh, who feel they can contribute to the general discussion. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to um, Michael, and um, Cheryl will share the screen. Michael, just remember to ask Cheryl to move your slides on when we get going. Um, hello, and uh, thank you, Sandy, for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I've really looked forward to joining you for these discussions. As you have heard, my name is Michael Mochiro. I am from Chenek Hospital in Kenya, and I'm also a member of the African Hospital Cancer Consortium, uh, AFRIC. Uh, next, please. So this is just a, a brief uh, introduction to where Tenwick is. If you look at the map on the left, that's a map of Kenya and uh, Bomet is in the southwestern corner of the country. Uh, it's a rural area. Uh, next, please. Um, the hospital serves around 800,000 people. It's a 300 bed uh, faith-based facility and uh, offering comprehensive care and uh, across the different specialties, surgery, obstetrics, medicine, pediatrics, and we do offer training here. Next, please. Uh, this map shows the current uh, participant sites in the African Esophageal Cancer Consortium. This was part of a paper that we published describing the consortium. And since then, um, the consortium starts from Ethiopia all the way down to South Africa and uh, Mozambique uh, joined us. Um, we also had interest from Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi. So it's been growing and principally it's been those uh, countries that have been doing research. That's how we started. And we since moved on to clinical care. Next, please. Uh, this slide shows um, 
the three key areas that we focus on. One is etiologic studies. And here we have the environmental studies. We've just finished uh, case control studies in four countries. And uh, we've been doing molecular studies together. Uh, we decided to pull all the specimens so that you can have a good uh, set of uh, data from Africa. So there's multi-site genomic wide association studies going on. We also have the treatment and palliation arm of which today I'll be speaking uh, a lot about the endoscopic and surgical training, the stent access program, and the ongoing outcome studies that are looking at survival for esophageal cancer. And then the last bit is the advocacy and awareness. And here we have been interacting with governments, policy makers, and other funders. Uh, next, please. So the objectives of this talk, briefly to review the unusual epidemiology of esophageal cancer, uh, the focus will be on squamous cell because of the uh, predilection, and then review the care and resource constraint areas where we look at esophageal disease and screening, uh, with surgical management and reducing preoperative mortality, and then the palliative care where we have increasing uh, stent training and access to stents. Next, please. So uh, let's look at esophageal cancer in Africa. As you're all aware, it's a belt that starts actually all the way from China, Iran. And when it comes to Africa, it runs along the East African coast all the way to Southern Africa and South Africa. A distinct uh, belt where the incidence is very high and it varies. It's around 20 to 30 per 100,000. Uh, more than 90% are squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, quite a number of these are actually found in young patients. And uh, we have a paper that we, a series of papers actually from Tenek that were dis, uh, describing this. There's tremendous genetic diversity. And one of the key areas is that uh, there's not been a lot of data. So we've not studied this cancer really well on this continent. Next, please. Uh, what are the challenges facing esophageal cancer care? Um, as we are all, I think this applies across the whole continent. The one is inadequate reporting systems. And uh, tied to this is the fear that uh, if you get this diagnosis, you are going to die. So patients have this fatalistic attitude. And then the late diagnosis, uh, which really is a factor of uh, the doses being missed. So you find many patients who have been treated for uh, reflux or abdom I mean, uh, abdominal chest pain and these non-specific symptoms before somebody decides to do an endoscope. And then we have inconsistent referral patterns where the patients, uh, by the time they get to a point of care that can offer them comprehensive care have been quite through a journey. The other challenge is the access to chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And I would actually would say like 10 years ago, this was really a key hinging point. And right now there's been a lot of efforts to improve this across the continent. And then you have financial constraints. And this here mainly it's uh, both angles. So if you look at uh, surgical treatment, the cost of an esophagectomy is really high, whichever country you choose in Africa. The stents uh, for palliation or radiotherapy, all of them come with costs and all of these make it difficult for patients to be able to get uh, care when they need it. The other part that ties to this is access to insurance cover. And this varies from country to country, but if I use Kenya as an example, it's actually an important aspect of ensuring that patients get access to treatment. Next, please. Um, these maps, uh, there's a couple uh, I'll be showing briefly. They show the age standardized rates, and actually you can see the blue, that's most of the African belt. Uh, so we have very high rates, and this is in males. The female picture next is also similar in nature. Where, um, next slide. Yeah, you can see it actually superimposes the male uh, uh, rates. So both in males and females, the rates are high. Though, if you look at the male to female ratio, we have more males having a fragile cancer. Next, please. And this illustrates what I was saying. Uh, the male to female ratio, it's still predominantly uh, male disease. Um, and then uh, the African rates are actually much higher than uh, the rest of the world. Um, next, please. Uh, here we look, and I think what to highlight that the, if you look at the incidence and the mortality, the number of cases that we catch is almost equal to the number of cases who pass on. And this is one of the key things that we need to work on on the continent to try and reduce this gap. So if you look at Eastern Africa, Southern Africa, the numbers are almost the same. So this shows why this cancer is really important uh, from that uh, public health perspective. Next, please. 
So at Tenek, we did uh, a review of uh, the cancers that we were seeing. And for a 10 year period, actually 20 year period, we were able to show that esophageal cancer was a third, 30% uh, of all the cases that we were able to count. The rest of the tumors were stomach, colorectal, cervix, breast, and then the rest were bunched together. Next. If you look at the data, we've uh, pushed out quite a bit. So the slide on the left, the uh, graph on the left top shows the age distribution. So the bars in black are looking at the data from China and the bars in light gray are showing the US numbers. And you can clearly see the skew of the data to the left showing a much younger uh, population of patients. We've done um, some studies looking at risk factors. We've, we've measured the serum selenium and we found this was quite uh, low. Uh, we've looked at uh, markers of metabolites in urine and uh, we're able to establish this. We also did some T temperature studies, uh, but the common uh, thing across the years has been that a very small percentage of cases are actually resectable. And so due to this, uh, this point, you're only offering them palliative care. Next. This slide uh, illustrates this point, and you can see um, the average age was 25. Uh, this was one of the early papers that we put out, published by Dossi et al. Uh, the male to female ratio is as I pointed out, and if you see the squamous cell to adenocarcinoma uh, comparison, compar com uh, comparison is actually much higher. Next. So what is the elephant in the room? And, and the reason I say this is, uh, we have this belt along the African, uh, Southern and Eastern African belt where we have uh, high rates of esophageal cancer. So we think that there is something in these populations that we haven't quite found because if you look at the traditional risk factors, you know, tobacco and alcohol that has been shown, uh, diet, um, then with the, the emergence of the tobacco carcinogens, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, uh, the hot drinks, uh, there's been questions about contact with ruminants, and then uh, some few good papers, actually one from Kenya that was published last year showing a good association between poor oral health and esophageal cancer, and then low socioeconomic status and family history. But we still think above this, there has to be something else because these populations are diverse. So we think that um, it might be genetic where there's some muting or there's something, some unknown risk factors that we haven't quite identified that is causing this unusual geographical pattern. And of course, if you want to find elephants, the best place we'd say is here on our continent. So we've been looking keen to see, is there something? And we hope that the case control studies that we've just finished will be able to show some, to shed some light on this. Uh, next, please. So let's look briefly at workup and staging for sphagial cancer, next. And here, uh, Oh, actually, there's a, a poll. Uh, uh, Sandy, I think we can run the poll. And the question is, at your institution, what modalities of treatment are available to treat esophageal cancer? And you can choose from the options that are available. Uh, stents, brachytherapy, chemotherapy, or external beam radiotherapy. Yeah, please, please go ahead and, and vote. Um, we're really interested to see what resources are available around the, the continent. So you should be able to vote. Are you seeing the poll, everyone? Because there's no voting going on as far as I can see. There's no poll. Uh, there's no poll. Oh, you can't see the poll? Yes. Can you stop the share and we'll run the poll? Okay. We're just going to stop the share. So Cheryl will have to do that. And then we'll come back to it. Okay, can you That's see the poll now? Yes. Yes, I can see the poll now. Okay. If you could vote on the poll, that's great. Can I end the poll? Yeah, I think you can end it, yeah. So, Michael, I think you could take over again. You can see exactly what the audience is up to. It does look as though yeah. there's a wide array of treatments available. Yes, uh, and it's interesting looking at the results we have. So, stents and chemotherapy seem to be 
used in all, almost by everyone. And then brachytherapy is the least used and then external beam radiotherapy slightly more than half. Uh, and I think I agree with you, this, this is actually a reflection of what is going on uh, even in our own country. So across the continent, the challenges have been like for radiotherapy, the machines themselves, and then the cost. Um, the stents and the chemotherapy, uh, because of the push to have access to treatment, this has really uh, improved. Uh, so I think we can proceed uh, and we can take questions as we go along. So thank you. This slide um, shows the harmonized guidelines. So what, what uh, happened is that the NCCN put together a group of experts and they reviewed the current uh, global guidelines. And you can see, so what they have in black is what is available uh, in most settings. And then what they have in uh, uh, pale gray is what should be available, but may not be available in our setup. So you can see, like if you're doing workup uh, history and physical, upper GI endoscopy, a chest CT, pelvic CT, and then a PET scan is in gray because some places do not have access to the PET scan. It will not stop you from offering care. And then uh, lab works like the CBC that's available almost everywhere. And then if you look at the EUS um, endoscopic resections, those are not available in many places. And so they are added as options. And actually for many years, uh, people would go straight to esophagectomy if those uh, endoscopic options are not available. And then um, treatment options, uh, markers, um, and then down here, additional workup, bronchoscopy, uh, for junctional tumors, assigning the CWAT category, and then uh, nutritional assessment and counseling. This is really important because of the very good data that has shown that poor nutrition has been associated with uh, bad outcomes and poor prognosis. And then smoking cessation, advice and counseling. And then you can look on the right, you have the options for staging and depending on where they fit uh, for squamous cell and adenocarcinoma, there's a whole new uh, table algorithm that you can work through. Next, please. So let's look at alias fragile disease. Uh, next. Um, uh, the slide that just skipped, uh, go back one, um, highlights one of the early screening studies that we did. So in around 2011, 2010, uh, we were asking these questions because we were seeing a lot of advanced tumors. And one of the questions was, is there something we can do to catch uh, these patients early? And so uh, one of the colleagues on our team had done a lot of work in China. And uh, after narrating the experience, we actually decided to do this, a similar study. And what we did was an uh, asymptomatic population that we sampled and we did Lugol's chromoendoscopy. And so uh, as uh, some of you might, actually most of you are aware, when you stain the esophagus, the normal cells take up the Lugol's and then the abnormal cells or dysplastic cells do not take up the Lugol's. So you can see the white areas. Uh, these are the dysplastic areas. So we did this in the community. We in, uh, interviewed asymptomatic uh, people. The exclusion criteria was actually dysphagia or any symptoms of tumor. We actually did across the entire age bands from 20 all the way to 80. And then we stratified them by age and by pathologic diagnosis. And at the end of this study, what we found was that uh, the high grade dysplasia rate was actually 3.9%, but the total dysplasia rate was 14%. And uh, based on this, uh, we then raised the question of what else can we be able to do in terms of setting up screening programs in Kenya? So we were able, in Kenya and in the continent. We were able to show that uh, it's feasible, it's easy to do because all you need is Lugol's iodine and endoscope, and then having a team trained to do that. And so currently there are actually collaborative efforts going on, not just in Kenya, but across the consortium countries where we've been training um, endoscopists in Lugol's from endoscopy. And like in the country now, we are having discussions about doing uh, additional screening uh, studies. Next, please. So endoscopic therapy, once you find the lesions, uh, then you have to be able to offer them treatment. So there are uh, multiple options, so excisional methods, these include endoscopic mucosal resection, multiple, multiple band mucosectomy, esophageal submucosal dissection. And really these are for the early tumors, uh, depending on the staging. And they're technically more difficult. Uh, the ablative methods are easier because you just apply the, the 
energy to an area. But the resect, um, excisional methods have higher risks of adverse events, and these include bleeding, perforation, and stricture. And so we've been able to offer this here um, for early patients, and actually some have been able to get cure uh, after follow-up. And one of the papers that is coming out soon will be highlighting the experience we've had with uh, endoscopic therapy for early disease next. Uh, this picture just shows a mural of different uh, Lugol's endoscopy slides. Um, and as you can see, they can either be large uh, on one side or they can be mosaic, like the ones at the bottom. And the, the ones that are mosaic are more favorable to do uh, ablative uh, techniques. Uh, the ones that are uh, more focused, then you can be able to excise or still apply uh, energy at that spot. Next. Um, so just to highlight what you've said, this picture just shows uh, the different techniques of doing the excisional methods. And at the bottom, you can see ablative options using uh, agon plasma coagulation or radiofrequency ablation. Next. Um, this also sl uh, slide illustrates the same thing. So this is the technique for doing mucosal resection. Uh, just a brief uh, highlight, uh, is inject in the submucosal space, um, you lift up uh, the area that is affected, and then you use a cup technique to be able to snare it off, and then the specimens are mounted. Next. Uh, this is multiple mucosectomy. It's almost similar to what I've just illustrated. The only difference is uh, you can actually do this with the bandas, uh, regular bandas, and uh, once you've done the snare, and lift, uh, apply the band, and then uh, resect the area and send them to pathology. So the main difference between excisional and uh, ablative is that the pathologist can give you a report on how deep the tumor is. So uh, there's argument about which has, is better, but usually you actually have a depth, you can talk about the disease invasion. Next. Uh, radio frequency ablation, uh, this uh, just shows how to do it. Uh, the technology has actually improved a lot. Um, you supply the probe, you apply, size them appropriately. Now they are self-sizing probes, apply energy to the area and then uh, move sequentially and they can have uh, sequential um, uh, uh, applications of the ablative energy until you get uh, complete resolution and follow up endoscopy. So it's very key that you're able to do surveillance for these patients and you're able to follow them up. And that will be one of the components for the screening programs when you're setting them up. Next. So these are the components. So one of the questions we ask is if you are to do this successfully in Africa, what would be needed? So one is uh, a way of identifying the precursor lesions. And then next would be setting up a primary screen. Uh, the other thing is the endoscopic localization and treatment, and then you have staging and therapy that come together. So you can still see it's a multidisciplinary approach. Next. So uh, based on data from China, it's actually been shown that um, uh, endoscopic screening programs um, actually have got uh, a, a very good uh, impact on the populations that uh, this is being done. And you can see here, uh, this was a good paper from Wei et al, uh, where they looked at villages that were assigned to either intervention or control groups, they were, uh, they were non-adjacent, and the intervention was a single endoscopic procedure. Uh, they got Lugol's uh, common endoscopy, and then they biopsied all and stained lesions that were more than five millimeters. Then the treatment offered was either EMR and or uh, ablative techniques. And then um, the, it's had to be biopsy proven. And you can see how it was for dysplasia, carcinoma in situ, or uh, very early tumors, T1M uh, squamous cell carcinoma. The follow-up was done uh, monthly, and then these patients are follow-up for a decade. And you can clearly see uh, the intervention and control that the deaths um, in the control group compared to the intervention group are actually higher. So this is actually a good rationale to say that there is um, uh, a good point to show even for sphagial cancer that is notoriously difficult to detect and treat, that if we set up these screening programs, we can be able to have uh, impact in terms of survival and uh, uh, length of life. Next. And so based on this, uh, Kenya as a country adopted um, screening for sphagial cancer as one of the uh, packages. Uh, we, we were able to sit down and uh, discuss the feasibility of doing this. And because sphagial cancer was actually the number one cause of mortality in 2020 when, uh, 2018 when this was coming out, 
uh, it was actually of great concern at that particular time. Uh, next, and so um, we adopted the same uh, guidelines that have been implemented uh, by the Chinese. And uh, uh, next, please. These include a one-time screening endoscopy at uh, age uh, 40 for everyone. For asymptomatic individuals who live in high-risk areas, they get a one-time screen. And then for individuals who have first-degree relatives. So in our endoscopy clinic currently, anyone who comes and get a biopsy proven as fragile cancer, then we talk to the family and offer uh, screening endoscopies to any first-degree relatives who are 10 years younger than the index case. And so if they are 40 and above, then they automatically get a screening endoscopy. And then the other indications we have in our guidelines is patients with head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, uh, one-time endoscopy every 10 years, and then patients with caustic injury, uh, 10 years from the injury. These guidelines are evolving. Um, there's, there's still discussions about doing this. But right now, all of the high-risk counties are actually now joining into this uh, discussions about setting up these screening programs. And there's a big discussion about funding and then the feasibility. Uh, next. Uh, so we'll have a pause here and uh, I think uh, do another poll or take questions uh, or comments. I saw the hour. Yes, uh, maybe I can start, Michael. In fact, what I'd like to do is ask uh, Wisdom. Wisdom um, is from uh, um, Zimbabwe. He trained here in Johannesburg. And, mm -hmm. uh, posting quite a few questions. So perhaps you could uh, unmute um, Wisdom and ask your question. Oh, thank you, Prof. Sandy. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, I can hear you. Yeah, on the chat I posted, uh, thank you very much, Michael. It looks like you are doing great work there. And I just wanted to find out, have, having listened to you, I don't mm -hmm. hear if you are going to tell an endoscopist in any of these countries, screen mm -hmm. this type of patient, which patient do we have to screen we, with which specific risk factors? Because your presentation to me was not clear. And you also went on to do a screening in asymptomatic in your region. We didn't mm -hmm. hear how many patients you, you included in your study and how mm -hmm. many turned out with the Lugos um, uh, iodine in your endoscopy who turned out to have a squamous cell cancer of the mm -hmm. esophagus. And then my third question is, you say the guidelines in Kenya are now at 40 years. Do your patients, do you all do them with Lugos or is just a, an endoscopy without Lugos? Thank you. Thank you, Wisdom. Um, those are excellent questions. And actually my apologies for not uh, elaborating further on the study we did. Um, so I'll start with that. Um, we actually went out into the normal asymptomatic population. So uh, just to point out the main difference. So what we were doing for screening, we are looking at uh, people that do not have disease. So the whole idea of, of screening for disease is looking at normal asymptomatic populations and trying to find out a way of picking them out. But then look at early, early detection and early diagnosis, then that's where it, um, patients with esophageal cancer, how do we pick out the ones who have early disease much earlier? So if you separate those two components, uh, that is why you, you realize all the screening studies are set up in normal populations. And so for this particular study, we did 300 subjects. We went out into the village, we recruited 300 uh, people after doing the statistics and powering. And we were able to bring them all in. So they all got a Lugos from endoscopy and then we biopsied any areas that were dysplastic. And that's how we got the 14% uh, overall dysplasia and the 3.9 high grade dysplasia. The question you ask, which is really important is, um, uh, do we, like in our endoscopy units, do we screen everyone? Do we do the Lugos from endoscopy on everyone? And the answer is no. We offer the chromoendoscopy uh, based on uh, one is the aspect I mentioned in that table. Um, if they have a confirmed relative with esophageal cancer and they are 10 years younger, if they have the reached the age of 40 and they come from like, you know, where I, I work and live or met, it's a high risk area, we automatically give them a screening endoscopy. Or if they come and they say uh, they are concerned, they have a family member, we actually allow for patient preference. And so 
the next level up was that as a country, we asked the question, and I think this will be the question even for yourself in Africa, how feasible is it for us to do this in large populations? And so I would say, uh, if you are stratifying like in Zambia or in Malawi or in Kenya, I would say focus the legal spermoendoscopy to the districts or the counties that have high rates of esophageal cancer, because that's where you'll have the most uh, money, uh, I mean, value for money. So if you look at our data, out of every 100 subjects, only four would have high grade dysplasia. So that means um, the cost benefit ratio still needs to be tweaked a little bit. So we would rather focus on where we have a higher chance of picking patients with dysplasia. The next part of your question is um, now the early detection, because I think in Africa, that's where we really need to put a lot of effort. Um, exactly. pick, picking, picking the people with uh, esophageal cancer, but getting it early. Uh, so we do a lot of esophagectomies here. We do around 40 to 50 a year. Uh, and it's not as high as the West, but for our setup, it's really, we are a high volume, we are considered a high volume center. And uh, the reason we do this is one, now people know they can send patients here, but also we've been doing a lot of aggressive campaigns on the radio, the vernacular, you know, the local radio stations in the local languages. Uh, we've, we've done TV shows, we've done the newspaper, we've done campaigns. So the goal is to tell people that hey, if you have the following symptoms, dysphagia, odinophagia, weight loss, uh, vomiting blood, a, a, a relative with esophageal cancer, you need to come and get an endoscopy procedure done. So that's really helped in capturing patients. And the other bit has been using survivors and having them share their experience uh, in the clinics. You know, they come and they talk to the other patients. So they see that if you get surgery, you will not die. Actually, the biggest fight we've had here has been convincing members of the public that they can come for diagnostic workup and treatment and they'll be able to go home safely. Uh, many people fear uh, interventions because they've seen people die and usually it's because they were so advanced that they had bad outcomes. So uh, uh, wisdom, those are really, really good questions. And I think it's, it's one of yeah. the reasons why screening for sphagial cancer in Africa um, has been slow to take up as opposed to cervical cancer and breast cancer where it's really straightforward, you know. Um, you, you, you clearly know the population that you're able to work with. For us, uh, it's been um, uh, showing that this can be done successfully, even though it's in small uh, clumps, it's gaining more and more traction. So thank you, those thank were excellent questions. Ma Michael, can I ask you, there, there's one question here from Stephen Hobner, who is in the middle of the country with us in mm -hmm. South Africa, about mm -hmm. hot millet porridge which is, was identified as a possible injurious agent in West Kenya, which is where you mm -hmm. are, I suppose, and Uganda mm -hmm. towards the shores of the lake. Is that, mm -hmm. factor, is that fact or fiction, or <laughs> is it just another factor that we should consider? I think, the, so if you're a true epidemiologist, this is where the arguments uh, uh, get really uh, interesting because they would say, we haven't established a true causal association to be able to say that uh, uh, hot millet um, is directly connected. But what has been shown is that hot drinks per se, so hot, hot porridge, uh, hot coffee, hot tea, I mean, the odds ratios have clearly been shown to be high for those who ingest this in Iran, in China, in Kenya, in Uganda for, for, for this particular instance. So personally, I would say, I think there's a lot of truth to it. And I think for porridge, because of the viscosity, uh, if you take it hot, it moves slower and burns more. Uh, but we can never prove those smaller differences because people argue, uh, my gulp size is different from yours. So if, if you take a big gulp and I take a small gulp, I'll have more exposure. And then secondly, how long does it take between you swallowing and you getting to the stomach? And how many exposures do you need before you get change and get us for cancer. So I agree. I think hot drinks, including porridge, are a possible injurious factor. And uh, we've been advising the people here to just take their drinks cooler than they would. So allow it to just sit for a while and drink it. The, the Kipsigis who live here take really hot tea. Um, and so it's, it's one of our campaign points also around here. Uh, allow the drinks to cool down. So I agree. I would say, yes, consider it as a 
as a, a risk factor. So I, I have an interest in, in some of the epidemiological data on colon cancer and, mm -hmm. and on esophageal cancer. But how good do you really think the incidence figures are that we see published from the IRC and Global Scan? And, and how do you really know how common this cancer is? Mm -hmm. the, so I agree with you. The, actually, one of the limitations we have, and that's why like Kenya as a country, was the data was not accepted into the CR cancer in five, CIC five, was that there's so much missing data and we have many hospital-based cancer registries as opposed to true population-based cancer registries. So one of the areas uh, which like the, you know, IOTIC, the African Organization for Research and Training in Cancer has been working on, has been improving yeah. the population level data. So I would say, actually we are grossly under-reporting. Um, I, I think the incidence is not truly captured. So we, we take the numbers with a pinch of salt, but what we've truly identified is that there are clear high-risk areas, you know, like Comet, uh, Malawi, uh, South Africa. So there are areas where we can see the high rates. It's just that the numbers may not be matching what is truly being reported. And this is where there's a lot of room for continuous improvement. Thank you. Um, one of the other questions is um, the, uh, the, um, it's relating to the EMR. Mm -hmm. and we, in practical terms, when you do it, is it just the ability for the area to be lifted for you to do these EMRs? I.e., is fancy assessment necessary for an EMR if you if it lifts? Yes, because if it does not, so if it does not lift, you actually get concerned that there might be uh, the depth of invasion might be more than what you are seeing, and that's why EUS comes in really handy when you're trying to make those determinations. Um, and so I think many people agree that you, you should be able to get good lift. The other question that somebody asked uh, was whether the biopsy of the unstained areas, uh, does that affect lift? And from, from what I've seen and from what we've done here, it, it, it really doesn't, uh, because if, if, you, if you're able to get into that plane and to the lift nicely, then the area comes in. And usually the, EMR is done a few days to weeks after the initial uh, biopsies to determine which areas, you know, you tattoo, you mark the areas, and then you come for the next setting to do your treatment uh, uh, modalities. So I would say if, if, if the area looks like it does not lift, then you get a bit concerned that you may be dealing with more advanced disease, but it's always a multi-modality discussion about how do we, um, appropriately treat that particular segment uh, that is involved. Um, yeah. Can I, there's a couple of other questions. So I'm just going to, to give you two of them and then I think we mm -hmm. must move on. But one mm -hmm. of them is we, we've, some of us have, have been aware of the study in China where they use the cytosponge. Do you think yes. there's any place for that in the South African setting? And just to inform you that I'm sure you're aware, but the Eastern Cape, is where mm -hmm. our, our hot spot is. And mm -hmm. some of it drains to the two provinces adjacent, to Western province and to, to um, uh, KwaZulu-Natal because of the poor services uh, in those mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think this, this concept of looking intensely at screening in, in areas of high incidence uh, is, is a great idea. I think we just mm -hmm. have to define, define what high incidence is because mm -hmm. that will make a, make a huge difference to the numbers. Mm -hmm. But please, if you could ask the, answer the question on the cytosponge, and then mm -hmm. in the same bread, what about human papillovirus? We know okay. that's involved in squamous cancers. Is it involved in CA esophagus? Mm -hmm. So um, actually, thank you for the question on cytosponge. I think this truly has the capacity to be a game changer, especially in our continent. And uh, like for South, and Af South Africa, it will be really uh, helpful. So we are actually already piloting this here at Tenwick. We've been doing a trial on uh, use of the cytosponge. And um, the, the, right now we are comparing the cytosponge to the standard chromoendoscopy. 
and the tolerability, ease of use has actually uh, made it much easier. I think there's very good data from Barrett's esophagus. There's also very good uh, data from the Chinese who've been doing cytosponge for squamous cell. Uh, and I think because of the cost and the ease of use. So for, for Lugol's, you need an endoscopist. For the cytosponge, our research nurse does it. The patient sits on the table, they swallow the sponge, you wait some time, you pull it out, you put it in the solution, you send it off and you are done. So I, I personally think that the game changer for treatment for sphagial cancer and screening will be us finding something, whether it's a cytosponge or a blood test that will make it so much easier for us to figure out who needs to go for a further workup as opposed to screening, treating everyone. So I think uh, you should consider taking this up and, and trying it out. We hopefully will be able to share our results from this uh, use of cytosponge. The team in Tanzania just finished a pilot and I think they've published one paper on tolerability and use in an African setup and they'll be continuing on to, to use it uh, as part of their screening uh, setup. So I think uh, really this, this would be a useful, especially for area where there's challenges in access to endoscopic equipment. The next question on HPV, um, I think right now there's been a number of studies done trying to look at associations uh, between HPV and esophageal cancer. And so far the, it has not been conclusive. So we, we've not been considering it as a classical risk factors. We looked at uh, similar data also here in Kenya and we had similar findings. Um, I know there's, there's a number of case controls that are trying to also relook at this question on HPV um, and esophageal cancer. And so far, uh, we'll wait to see if there's any new data. But right now, it's been associated with the, you know, the oral tumor, the laryngeal uh, yeah. Yeah. tumors, but not esophageal cancer. Yeah. Michael, I think we're going to have to move on there. There are a few questions there, and there are a few enthusiasts who want to join your African Consortium. So we ah, will excellent. So we will certainly, and myself included, but uh, mm -hmm. I think you need the youngsters rather than the, than the old guys with, with <laughs> radio. But nevertheless, <laughs> I think we should move on to the next section and uh, okay. we'll see if we can get to these questions at the end. So, Thank you. So Cheryl, if we could advance the slides again. Okay, so next I'll briefly look at surgical management. Um, I had to put this in here because this is what we, we do here. Um, so next, please. For, for surgery, um, I think the key highlight of this talk would be to say that um, patient selection is key. And for us, uh, the evolution of our time has been, we, we've come up with a list of what we call these uh, pre-op uh, considerations, which everyone has, but for us, we had to tailor them to the African population here. Uh, it's a key component of the workup. And for us, we do you know, a performance status assessment. Uh, we ask them what work they do at home, how active are they? Because all those give you little pointers into their fitness or tolerability of the surgery. Eyeball test is um, uh, when they walk in, do, you, know, you can quickly say how nourished or not nourished they are, uh, what their approximate BMI is. Uh, we, we've been able to show, and this has been shown by other people that uh, low BMIs have bad outcomes. We do what is called a stair stress test. So technically this is a, actually a pulmonary function test. And uh, our theater um, here above it, there's an auditorium. So we usually make them just walk up and down the stairs as we watch. And then uh, if, if they get out of breath and cannot walk, it's, it's one more uh, key. Uh, now we actually have a proper pulmonary function test, which is done and uh, recorded. We do echoes, we do uh, ECGs. Uh, so the imaging, we, we, we work them up uh, thoroughly. So the imaging we discussed earlier was the CT, uh, PET scans, um, just to be able to know where they are at in terms of uh, metastatic disease, if it's there or depth of invasion. It's very important when you're thinking about dissection around the uh, carina area. Um, discussion with the patient. So we tell them upfront what will be coming. You know, you'll be seven days in the ICU, uh, you'll be NPO, we'll do a swallow test at this day, you'll have to do uh, exercises post-op, you will not be eating, you'll, you'll reduce your meal size. So we do all these discussions to help prepare them because we found 
uh, it makes it easier afterwards. And then we do this uh, pre-op assessment, uh, anesthesia comes in, nutritionists come in, uh, we have the discussion with the nurses um, as we prepare for the surgery. And then usually the last bit is after we have all this information, what choice of approach, whether you do it, uh, you know, the, the different types, either Louise, McEwan, um, depending on where the tumor is, which uh, I think for today's talk, we will just leave it at that. Next, please. Uh, so I put this slide up. Uh, we, we published a paper. This paper was actually looking at uh, patients who had HIV and had surgery. Um, and by the time we were writing this paper, one of the questions, uh, and actually it was in a meeting in Durban, I remember, we were doing some presentations and uh, we, we were looking at, the question was who does HIV play a role? And uh, if you look on the left, you see at the bottom there, in 2004, we thought if you're HIV positive, it was an absolute contraindication. But as uh, the, there was more data and more studies coming out, uh, that was changed uh, because everyone actually agreed that HIV positivity does not change anything. It's, you just have to control, have them on medications, prepare them well. And so it became a relative contraindication uh, because the only thing you would check is the low CD4, whether they are cachectic um, and whether they are fit for surgery. And actually when we looked at the data between HIV positive and uh, non-HIV patients, there was actually no difference. Uh, and actually some of the HIV patients actually had better outcomes because they had more clinic visits they were under more, uh, there was more scrutiny. And so right now the indications for surgery are of course absence of metastatic disease, we check our albumins and we put a marker there. BMI has to be more than 18.5. Age more than 70 is actually right now has been revised. So we actually operate on patients older than 70. Uh, we just put them through the paces and make sure they are fit enough. And then tumor length less than 10. And if you put in a stent, um, and, and as all of you are aware, the ASG and ESG guidelines uh, currently they say there's no, they, it's not good to put stents if you're going to have surgery. And so for us, because we use stents as a bridge, we ensure that they're less, they are for less than eight weeks. Because if you leave them longer, then you have difficult dissections. The planes become much harder. Um, somebody asked a question about EUS, which I think I'll answer right now. If it's available, EUS is actually good, uh, not just for early disease, but also for locally advanced, because it helps to give you an idea. Uh, yes, endoscopic ultrasound. Um, it gives you an idea about how, the depth and the nodal involvement, because you can see that um, before you take these patients in for surgery. We don't currently have that available in Tenek, but it's available in Kenya. And so it's a really, really good adjunct to be able to use <clears throat> when you're working up your patients. Next, please. So this is highlighting uh, the uh, discussion on stents as a bridge to surgery. You can see this patient, the BMI was 16. They were not fit for surgery. They came in, you put in a stent, next. And within four weeks, they went home, uh, they were able to feed and you can clearly see they had very good improvement. So by the time they came back, they had gained weight. They were now operative candidates, next. And uh, here is the esophagectomy that was done. You can see the tumor uh, in the esophagus there. Uh, the conduit has been prepared and mobilized and ready for anastomosis, next. And once we remove the specimen, you can see the stent, uh, the proximal part, this is a Chinese, uh, metallic stent, uh, the, uh, the top part has embedded nicely in the tissues and usually the specimen is sent to pathology. Oh, yeah, minus the stent. Uh, the running joke we always have here for the residents is that we recycle the stents, <laughs> but they are single use. But we've been able to show that um, stents um, are able to help you bridge that gap and help move patients from being an operable in terms of nutrition to operable candidates. Next. Um, I have a few slides here looking at mortality and morbidity. I think esophagectomy, everyone agrees, um, is fraught with uh, complications. As that's, that's a mantra we had when we were being trained. The mortality, as you can see, is variable, 3 to 20%, which is quite high. And look at the complication rate, 25 to 65%. And majority of them are actually around anastomotic leaks um, and, and problems uh, post-op with pulmonary function, pneumonia. And, and things like this. So you need to be really keen if you're doing this and I would advocate actually that we allow this to be done in high volume centers that do this every day. I think that truly is the future, having centers of excellence that do this next. 
Um, so to decrease perioperative mortality, uh, as I said, uh, high volume centers, increase training exposure. So this uh, have the residents or the surgeons actually have hands-on experiences and then build up the ICU infrastructure components uh, because this is really critical in getting these patients through these surgeries and having uh, access to full-time endoscopic capability to be able to help you troubleshoot either pre or post-op. Next. Um, the other issue is adjuvant and neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, 10 years ago, uh, actually Russ White did a paper here and uh, it was titled when all you have is a hammer because uh, what that meant is we could only offer surgery and everyone who came in got surgery and went home. Uh, but right now there's the option of doing adjuvant and neoadjuvant uh, therapy. And so uh, the main rate limiting block has been the cost of getting this done. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the lack of radiation therapy units. So these are areas where we can work with. Next. Aha, we have room for questions. I saw questions about fluoroscopy and I'll be getting to that in the next part as we look at palliation. Um, yeah, so I can answer that then. Uh, Sandy, any other comments uh, or do we proceed? I think we should just proceed, uh, Michael. For, Thank for, you. For, for that aspect. And we can take all the questions uh, at, at the end. Okay, perfect. Uh, next, please. Uh, so now, as, a, as, a, as we transition to the palliative bit, um, we looked at data for, uh, this was a 10 year period for survival following treatment. And for, for those who got stents only, the median survival is nine months. Uh, the dysphagia score at the time of death is zero to two, which is actually uh, quite good because it allows them to have um, you know, nutrition, a dignified end of life. For surgery alone, 24 months for stage one and two and 14 months. We are actually revising um, these uh, numbers very shortly. We'll be reviewing our data and, and uh, there's a few papers coming out and hopefully we'll be able to revise these numbers next. Um, so let's now transition to undesectable disease uh, next. Um, we have a number of options for treatment. These include uh, palliative chemo radiation, uh, stenting, uh, using the self-expanding metallic stents, uh, feeding tubes, and these include uh, the G-tubes, uh, jejunal tubes, and then the other important element is hospice care and social support. It is still a multidisciplinary approach and usually it's also helpful to help the patients understand you know, the complexities and why uh, this is the only, these are the options that are remaining at this point in time. Next. Uh, there's actually a quiz here before you proceed. Um, so I think we can, can do the poll. Yes, we will do the poll, I think. Can you run the poll, Cheryl? Um, yes, give me a moment. Um, Thanks very much. It's coming up. Okay. So please vote. I think you can stop it there, uh, Cheryl. Okay. And share okay. it. Yeah. Here we go. Aha. Uh -huh. This is interesting. So it looks like the highest uh, score was five to 10 a month. Um, and then more than 10, like only one person, <laughs> I think that was me. Um, less than five a year, uh, less than five a month, 18%. So it's actually variable. Um, for us, we, put in around 300 stents um, a year. Actually, it's now around 400 stents a year. And it's a reflection of the fact that we are a referral center. So we are getting patients being sent in. But it's also a reflection that there is a lot more advanced disease. So patients are not being caught early enough. Um, there's now more uh, options to go for radiotherapy and, uh, and have that available. So I think it's, it's partly a, an access issue and then uh, a cost issue, depending on which option you are able to, to be able to do. Uh, so let's proceed next. Aha, uh -huh, there's another poll. This Can is we run the poll, of... mm -hmm. Go ahead. It's coming up.
Perhaps you can can share that again. That's good. Uh -huh. So more than half are doing uh, with both fluoroscopy and endoscopy. Uh, then uh, with endoscopy, no one is doing it with fluoroscopy only. With endoscopy alone, five without fluoroscopy or endoscopy two. Uh, thank you. You can close that. I think um, so. This is dependent on what you have available, and also uh, what you how you are trained. Because uh, uh, a number of, of uh, uh, endoscopies were trained in using either fluoroscopy, uh, but almost everyone is is confident with doing both. Uh, for us here at Tenwick, we are actually doing using. Uh, the measurements, uh, so without fluoroscopy and we use the measurements technique and then we use the endoscopy to confirm the placement. And really it's been, it grew out of the lack of access to fluoroscopic services. So uh, based on that, um, let me progress to that session and then we'll discuss a little bit more about the placement options next. Um, so um, for, for, as I mentioned, we, Actually, 20 years ago now, um, Russ White uh, did one of the first papers looking at esophageal stent placement without fluoroscopy. Um, and then 10 years later, they were able to now publish another paper looking at outcomes if you only have stents as a sole therapy. And all of these stents were placed without fluoroscopy. Um, a few years back, we published, uh, this was a video GIE paper, modification to the stent delivery technique. And I think essentially we were saying um, that if you do this many times, then you're able to place the stent. Um, once you know the proximal and the distal portion, uh, then you're able to use measurements and then you're going to confirm. Uh, next, the, the key thing with this, uh, go back one slide, uh, with this technique is that, um, uh, as you can see here, um, for many of us, when you go in and you find the tumor is obstructing the lumen, then you have the next question of what next. And so for us, we pass the guide wire, we do dilation, and then we pass the scope to be able to see what the proximal and the distal uh, margin is. And then at that point, we have these discussions now about the stent length, the stent diameter, uh, depending on which type of stent you're using. Um, if you have very long tumors, uh, then you have the question of using multiple stents. And so we've placed over 4,000 stents um, to date. And um, actually, majority of these have been placed without fluoroscopy. There's a very small portion at the beginning that uh, were done with, uh, no, at the middle actually, uh, when we got a CM machine that had some fluoro used. But we, if we had any challenges, we would simply walk over the patient to X-ray um, or bring in a plate and shoot a start image because we did not have access to fluoroscopy. We've had very low uh, complication rates with this technique. Um, actually, from the paper that White et al. did, it was 1.9%. And uh, from the data that we have currently, that uh, percentage has actually dropped less than that. And so based on this, uh, we've been able to show that um, if, if you're very careful and attentive to detail, that you are able to do this successfully without fluoroscopy. Um, we do have access to the small diameter scope, which usually most of the times when you go in and you're not able to pass the large caliber scope, we switch to the Speed scope or the uh, nine millimeter scope, go through the stricture area, uh, pass a guide wire, do your dilations, and then pull out uh, and put in the stent. Uh, one of the papers that we published, uh, and there's been a number of papers and systematic reviews after that have shown that um, um, there's, there's some, uh, uh, when, you, when you go on the higher sizes of dilators, then you have more adverse events. So for us, we actually dilate to 36 French or 12, and uh, we put in the stents. If you are able to pass the scope without dilation, then we just go ahead and fire the, the stent. So I think it really depends on the type of stent that you are using. Um, the Chinese ones, uh, they have a radial force, so they open quickly as soon as you fire them. Uh, some of the American stents uh, open up slowly over a one to two day period. So you need to be aware which type of stent you're using. And then the other important consideration is where the tumor is in the location of the esophagus. So if it's distal or uh, proximal, then you choose a slightly smaller diameter stent. There's a good question, how often do we predilate? And for us, if we are not able to, so actually almost everyone gets a dilation. 
And uh, the reason we do this is we found that uh, with it, especially the Chinese stents, because they open up quickly, the dilation helps the stent to open up to its maximal diameter. Uh, one of the many questions I've had is, um, uh, is there not a risk of perforation or rupture? And I actually, uh, from our experience, we routinely dilate and stop at that six French and we've, we've not had, actually in the time we've been counting the last five years, we've not had a single perforation. We, it, it's really just attention to detail, but we think the dilation, predilation helps with the stent opening up. Now, if you are using um, some types of stents, the predilation has to be tailored. So if you decide I will predilate and you not go up to, you can stop at 30 French so that you allow some, some room for the stent to be held in position. So, and, and that's, that's the argument on both sides of the coin. But for us, we routinely dilate our patients and we've actually had uh, very good uh, outcomes. The distal tumors are a bit troublesome uh, with migration of stents. And so for these particular areas, if you're able to pass the scope, uh, uh, and actually the scope to some extent, you might consider that as some form of dilation, then you just uh, put in the stent. And if you do, you can put in the larger diameter stent, you know, like 23 millimeters because they will hold position uh, better. Um, next. Um, so this slide shows um, a fully open stent and you can see here, actually this is a Boston Scientific Ultraflex stent uh, as part of the <coughs> stent initiative uh, uh, project I'll talk about shortly. Um, and uh, this is a stent <coughs> ne next. Uh -huh. So this is the slide I was talking about. Um, the paper we did 2009, early complication rates, perforations 1.9 out of, this was actually 1,950 patients uh, that we dilated. And then bleeding 0.7, uh, mortalities uh, 0.3. And then you can see the late complications. The most common one was uh, overgrowth and obstruction at 16.5, and then migration and TE fistulas. Uh, one comment I'll make about T fistulas. Um, if we do find them, we, we of course get biopsies, uh, but we do not dilate, we just put in the stents. Uh, because if you already have a fistula, then you have a higher risk of, of uh, perforating uh, the esophagus if you continue on to dilate. Next. Uh, this is the Kaplan Meyer curve uh, looking at the survival, which we talked about. Uh, median survival is 250 days. Next. Um, and then uh, we put out quite a bit of papers on stenting, looking at uh, the location, um, you know, stenting for proximal tumors. And uh, usually for us, if the UES, upper esophageal sphincter, is up to a centimeter away from the tumor, we can stent those. Um, if it's more than that, if it's less than that, then you just dilate and you send them for radiotherapy. Um, and then, uh, oh yeah, we need to finish next. Uh, so let me quickly run through this. Uh, capacity building and training. I think this is the stent access project. Um, next. Uh, we were able to show that um, this can be done feasibly. And so as a consortium, after discovering that there's a need for both stents and training, we set up a training program. And so this was best. We started at Tenwek, Mark Topazian, myself, David Fleischer were the initial trainers. We had two trainers from Tanzania who came in, were trained, and they went back and became the trained the trainers in their own country. Next. And so this is the model that we are replicating. And so across the consortium sites, we've been doing stand training programs. We are due to do one in Ethiopia, uh, but COVID interrupted that. And then next, we'll be going to Mozambique uh, for the next training. Next. Um, this just shows the stand training process, you know, going through the didactics, um, the Boston Scientific kindly agreed to partner with us. So they've been supplying the stents for this project uh, so far. Um, they always accompany us for the training uh, uh, sessions uh, to show how to use the devices. And then you can see at the bottom there, the two trainees being shown and actually doing the stents by themselves. Next. Um, we went to Malawi last before COVID happened. And you can see this is a team at uh, Blantyre. Uh, we spent some time there uh, just going through stent training and working with the nursing and endoscopic teams. Next. 
Um, that's a technical endoscopy team as I finish. Uh, these guys do, so they run the endoscopy clinic. It's a mix of both nurses, research assistants, the endoscopists, and we have a staff chaplain who is always there with us because of the palliative care. Uh, the stent access uh, project has really done well because of the multiplicative effect. So each country is now running its own internal trainings. Like Tanzania has already done two. In Kenya, we're already planning the next, uh, actually three that are lined up. Uh, Malawi uh, did their own. Uh, Ethiopia is already running one. So we welcome any of you who are really interested in being part as trainers or participants in this uh, training exercises. Uh, you're most welcome to join us. So thank you so much for the time to share this long journey with you of what we do here at Tenwek and with the consortium. Uh, thank you. Oh, I should do the conclusion, sorry. <laughs> um, the care for special cancer really is multi-model and depends on the stage. A multidisciplinary approach is needed. We need to work on increasing stent training, endoscopy training, uh, exposure to surgical training, and then uh, as I talked about increasing perioperative outcomes. And then this question we've been discussing, how do we do screening in high risk populations like in South Africa? So thank you so much. Uh, let me hand over to Prof Sandy uh, for us to do the finishing part. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Michael. Uh, that really is a tour de force and it does really show how active you can be. Um, Again, it seems that you've outdone your Nairobi colleagues with your research agenda at what looks like a fairly modest hospital. And uh, I think I certainly take my hat off to you for achieving what you've done and obviously what the direction that you've obviously taken, taken things in. And I'm sure from my point of view in South Africa, we've got a lot that the youngsters can learn and hopefully take forward. Um, mm -hmm. I, unfortunately, a lot of esophageal cancer care in South Africa, I was at a very big unit in, in Durban, which essentially, because of political reasons, was fragmented and de decentralized. And mm -hmm. it has be been to the detriment of the esophageal cancer patients. Um, it, it happened at the same time as SEMS were introduced. And because of their simplicity um, mm -hmm. and the advanced stage of disease, it, it, it has decentralized the care in a lot of places. And um, I don't know, I think in some ways that's a, that's a bad thing. And we also used to do in Durban about 50 to 70 resections a year. And I think they're doing less than five or eight a year now. And mm -hmm. I think that's, I don't think the disease has gone away. So there are some suggestions that might be less frequent, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's to do with policy, um, mm -hmm. I, I believe. Anyway, um, there, there, there is a question here from, um, from Karen Gandhi, who also trained here. He had his hand up. So I'd like Karen to unmute if he's still there. I see his hand is uh, a lonesome hand there up in the left-hand corner. And then- uh, Yeah, thanks, thanks, Prof. Um, just awaiting my turn to ask a question. Um, thank you very much, Michael, for that talk. It was brilliant. And um, congratulations for all the work you've been doing. It's very, very impressive. And I think as Prof Thompson has said, you've outdone your colleagues in Nairobi in a big way. Um, mm -hmm. My question is, I, as Prof said, I, I trained at UCT and I'm now back in Nairobi um, mm -hmm. and I'm having quite a big challenge with, with placement of esophageal stents, not because of technical incapability, but more in terms of the, the attitude towards stents. I work in the private sector, I'm at the Aga Khan Hospital mm -hmm. and um, a lot of our CA esophagus patients are discussed at an MDT and, and there's this general attitude that stents are bad and most of them want our patients to get radiotherapy. Um, they complain uh, that, that stents are too painful for the patients. Um, but I see from your study, you show 1% uh, pain as, as the complication of stents. So um, I, I just want you to help me maybe make some comments. And do and, um, you think there's a different way we can approach? This? Should we speak to radiologists? Should we, I mean, to the radio oncologists? Should we show them this data? Should we... How, how can we, we move towards placing stents more in the palliative setting? Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, um, um, thank you think, Dr. Gandhi. I think, yeah, go ahead. I think, Michael, Michael, may I just interrupt? I think you may have to, that might be a very unique Kenyan situation that you could help with on a personal basis. And, mm -hmm. and we would obviously be interested to 
to know the solutions because that's that is a problem in our environment too. So mm -hmm. very briefly, if you want to, in in five words or ten words, just sort them out because I think we have to move to close to close the okay. session. Okay. Um, so I think I'll say briefly that um, the in, in when I think about this, the question is, what is a survival survival prognosis for the particular patient? If it looks like they will have uh, some, you know, they're in fairly good nutrition, they just have advanced disease, then you may say it's worthwhile to try radiotherapy now that it's available. However, the stents offer more rapid immediate relief. And there's been good data to show that you can still do radiotherapy even while they have the stents in place. And uh, there's actually some interesting papers that have shown the use of radio therapy in, in build stents that have been used to achieve the same outcome. So the, the radiotherapy gives you a good outcome for you know, bleeding um, and long, longer term outcomes, but the stents give you good short-term immediate relief and allow for nutrition right away, where many of these patients who show up in our clinics are usually at the far end of that spectrum. So we just give them the stents because A, it's cheaper, and B, radiotherapy, they have to go for multiple sessions. So if you think they will not be able to keep up with that, then it might be safer to give them the stand because at least you'll palliate them and they'll have a dignified end of life. So I think it's, for us, we found that it's better to put in the stands and then send them on to the oncologist and they can continue the treatment, um, especially if you're fully convinced it's metastatic disease and it's truly end stage disease. In the middle there where there's possibilities of surgery, then you apply the earlier discussions we had had. Uh, I'm happy to take this uh, discussion offline. Um, I think you can email me. Uh, I will put my email in the text um, and we can stay in touch um, if there are further questions. I, I have one last question before we oh, wind yeah. up, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, yes, please. And, and that's to do with, obviously you had a trial and you had stents donated or but what's obviously that's not really a financial model that the stent companies can really sustain or mm -hmm. is um because interestingly enough we have extreme provincial variation in mm -hmm. how stents are procured because of the inefficiencies of certain of our provinces so the area with the highest incidence of cancer of esophageal cancer has the lowest ability to access stents. So, so what, what, um, how, what's the sustainable model going forward? Or should we be moving to Chinese stents, which may be cheaper? The current price for one in our environment is 7,500 rand in the public sector and about 14,000 mm -hmm. rand in the states, in the, in the private sector. Wow. So those are still quite considerable sums. Mm -hmm. um, so what's your, out with the consortium and, and, a, and a sort of um, limited supply from, from suppliers, what's the mm -hmm. long-term long -term solution? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that's, that's really a key question, which- uh, Sorry, Michael, a short, short answer to that, please. We are running out of time, Sandy, and quick wrap up afterwards. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so I would say for the consortium, we've been able to maintain access because of the partnership with the one stent company that has been supplying the stents. But for other places that do not have that model set up, um, I think it's worthwhile exploring. Uh, like for us, we have the option of buying uh, the in the Kenyan market Chinese and Korean stents, which are slightly cheaper than the ones from Europe. Um, so I think it would need some internal discussions per country. Thank but for the, yeah. for the consortium, we are doing the stent access program. Yeah. Thank you very much. So mm -hmm. thank you, Michael. I think the, the amount of discussion that you've generated from across the, across the spectrum of all the countries is fantastic. And I, I thank you very much for your talk. And I, I really hope we can interact further. I would just like mm -hmm. to say a, a, a few more thank yous again to to echo India and echo um, in New Mexico uh, for continuing to support us um, with this endeavor. Um, again, we, uh, these, are, these are recorded, so individuals who want to access uh, the discussions and the, the material, uh, these are available on the 
the Gastro Foundation website. And um, again, we would like to thank the, the sponsors who are involved with the Gastro Foundation. Oh, we've just lost Sandy. Oh. Uh, uh, we've just lost Sandy. Well, I, can okay. I take over then, if you don't? <laughs> really to thank uh, everyone. But Michael, really to thank you for this uh, really brilliant work and excellent presentation. And please, we are here to collaborate in any way and, uh, and help strengthen our ties with Kenya. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, and thank you very much. Thank Cheryl you. and um, Karen, can I have next week's program, please? Just then, finally, I want to mention to uh, our program next week, which is an extraordinary meeting of um, uh, in, in collaboration with um, the GAS or Gastroenterology and Hepatology Association of South Africa, uh, is starting a collaboration with the um, African Union. Um, the new um, Partnership for African Development. It's the developmental organization of, of uh, AU. So whilst the foundation and GASA is really a charitable uh, organization, which tries to improve the education of, or uplift the education of, of, of fellow gastroenterologists and hepatologists and those in practice, they are ultimately, we are concerned in improving the quality of healthcare of all our patients in Sub-Saharan Africa. And there are some initiatives in all the subspecialties which require a top-down approach. And this is where a governmental organization like the, uh, the AU will become very, very important. So next week, we have this extraordinary uh, meeting. We have the president and in fact, founder of ECHO, Sanjibo Aurora, who will be um, saying a few words from New Mexico in, um, in the USA. And then the president of Arbor Nepad, uh, Ibrahim Mayaki, uh, who was also very excited by this initiative. So I'll all encourage you to attend. And in fact, this has been a, a long collaboration and I'm very pleased that we are able to begin this beginning next week with presentations from all our subspecialties um, to the AU. So with that, um, we'll call it a day or an evening. Thank you very much for your attention. Wherever you are on the continent, please take care of yourselves. These are trying times, a terrible mutant that we're facing. And I look forward to welcoming you to our Gecko session next week. Uh, thank you and goodbye. Thank you.